Good evening. Welcome to Monday Instagram Live as we have a special guest coming on today, Dr. C with PRMA Plastic Surgery. I want to open up tonight with Dr. C to go over discussing options for replacing failed implants with deep reconstruction. You know, really talking more about knowing your options and knowing what's going on in our community that we all have choices in breast reconstruction. I think it is so imperative to be aware of knowing what your options are. And that is one of my biggest pet peeves here at BRCA Strong is to make sure that we educate and provide all of these amazing resources. As breast reconstruction, I consider there is no gold standard. And I truly mean that. You know, if you go see Dr. A and he doesn't do deep or any of the flaps, you're not offered that. So I'm truly honored tonight to have Dr. C on to talk about, you know, deep, what it is, what it consists of, failed implants, and what your options are. And again, we all have options. And another option that we really need to talk about more is anesthetic flat closure. That is not the topic for tonight, but another breast reconstruction option out there. And women need to know that we have choices. And these choices are so imperative to be aware of. And sometimes, unfortunately, we have to be our own advocates. And if that's what it takes, you know, be your own advocate, educate yourself, try going on different nonprofits. Myself, I can say I have a huge page of every breast reconstruction option that is available out there. I think it is imperative, again, for women to be able to make that choice. So just bear with us as we are waiting for Dr. C to join us. And again, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tracy, the founder of Braca Strong. And we are so excited again. Oh, hey, Dr. C, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Likewise. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on tonight. You know, I was just telling the crowd what the conversation's about and telling them, you know, how imperative it is in our community to know your breast reconstruction options. And as you and I have spoken several times before, you know, I feel there's no gold standard. And that's just unfortunately some of the things that we have to face in our journeys and just making sure you're your own advocate and knowing that the resources that you have are so important and partners like yourself that Brock Song is partnered with and your partners is just an amusing, amazing opportunity for us to help advocate our women in our community. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to help out. I think what you guys do is fantastic. Uh, you know, you know how I feel about you guys. Um, so kudos to you. I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky to get connected with some really high quality patient advocates. Um, and you all know who they are. You're all connected yourselves. So it's a pleasure to help out. You know, we all love doing it. Um, Perfect. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to take a second and maybe do a short introduction, talk maybe a little about about yourself and your practice and like where you're located, because, you know, obviously we all share you on Instagram, but I know many women have different opportunities to be able to go to other states. And, you know, before we get started, that is something that I always want to share with women in our community and who's on this call, because some of us don't have access in our local communities to facilities like yourself and as an advocate in the community and facing you know, difficult journeys ahead and, you know, moving forward, I think it's imperative that women have transportation to different facilities. So one thing that Braca Strong does offer, which we are more than happy to help you get to Dr. C, and we work with patient airlift services to help women get to different states to be able to provide services like Dr. C offers in PRMA. Again, you know, if you don't have the options in your community and you need help with transportation, please feel free to reach out to myself. And Dr. C's office also has the information on what we can do and how we can get you there. Because as my journey is here to share, and what I have a dedication to is making sure that you're in the good hands of a good physician. So your outcome is one or two surgeries. It's not 11. Unfortunately, we do see that sometimes. You know, it, that brings up a good point, which we'll get to that, you know, breast reconstruction for most women is a journey. It's not a one off. The whole one and done thing is unfortunately just marketing for many people. 
you know, it, it's not their reality. Sometimes you can get a great reconstruction in one go. Um, and as I said, we'll talk about that, but really that's not the majority of women. So it's important for women to understand that for most people, it's a process, right? It's a process. Mm -hmm. but, um, anyway, you, you wanted a short intro. I mean, you know, yes. uh, <laughs> so um, I guess let's start there. Uh, I'm president of PRMA Plastic Surgery. I'm one of eight surgeons. We're all very, very passionate about what we do. It's, you know, the practice isn't, isn't me. Uh, I, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff online, but it's, it's the team. You know, we have a phenomenal team. We all share the same passion, uh, which is, you know, providing the best breast reconstruction uh, women can get. Uh, and men for that matter, because men get breast cancer too. Uh, but um, I'm very, very lucky. Uh, uh, you're only as good as your team. You can't do what, what I do as a solo person, at least. Uh, my hat goes off to all the solo microsurgeons out there that try and do this on their own year in, year out, but it gets pretty old. Um, so, you know, we focus on breast reconstruction. We see people from really... It's all over the world, really. I mean, COVID kind of obviously put a put a stop to our international traveling patients. Uh, but we see people from all over the country. Uh, unfortunately, access is an issue for some people, right? So um, hopefully what patients have access to locally in their communities is the procedure that they want, right? Because not everyone needs the cutting edge stuff that we offer, not everyone wants it, right? So uh, you can get a really good reconstruction with an implant. If you're a good implant candidate, you have a great breast surgeon, you've got great mastectomy, uh, skin flaps, you know, everything, all the stars aligned, you know, you can get a great reconstruction with implants with your local team, you know, but for some time, some women, it doesn't work out that way. You know, if you want tissue, uh, you know, maybe the local option is a latissimus flap only and, you know, from the back. Maybe you're okay with that. That's actually what you want. Maybe, you know, um, so not everyone has to travel, but it is important that people know they can or at least they can explore it, right? Because I'm also very sensitive to the fact that not everyone who wants to travel physically can for a variety of reasons, right? Whether it's financial or support or what have you, which is why groups like yours, you know, BRCA strong is so important, right? Because it can be a significant lifeline for people. So thank you again. Thank um, you. But, you know, so that's, that's, you know, what I do from a surgeon standpoint, that's my passion. That's, that's what I've been doing for many, many years now. Um, and then, um, you know. You're forgetting I, the Breast Advocate app. You have to tell everybody to download it. Yeah. Patient advocacy and shared decision making, that kind of, you know, we, we, we all evolve, right? And so when you start, start off in practice, it's very much the focus is on, you know, the technical stuff. You want to prove how good you are, you know, you've got an ego, you know. Then over time, you get more gray, you do more surgery, you know, you, uh, you become a little bit more humble, most of us, and your priorities change. And so you don't have anything left to prove really from a technical standpoint. Uh, but then other things become more important. And so a few years ago, I realized that, you know, there was something lacking uh, from what I was offering my patients. And so I, I, I kind of just got into more reading other things, uh, came across shared decision making as a concept, which is actually not new. Um, it, it's been, it was described in the 80s. Shared decision making basically means that the patient and the physician are equal partners in the treatment planning. So, you know, if you and I were having a consult over Zoom right now, I need to know what's important to you. I need to know what your support structure is. I need to know what your goals are, what you want to get back to in life, how you feel about implants, how you feel about tissue, you know. And then you need to know about, you know, my viewpoint, the evidence, the data, my expertise, and we kind of find a happy medium in the middle somewhere, right? And so... You could have two people with an identical diagnosis and the best treatment plan is completely different. And so 
And I thought, well, there's got to be an app for that, right? There's got to be an app out there that talks about breast cancer surgery and the options, all the options, evidence-based medicine, all that stuff, right? And mm-hmm. in a way that you know, patients have access to it. You know, it's got to be something online. Or, so, you know, a bunch of information online, mm-hmm. no shared decision-making apps about breast cancer surgical options. So I put a team together and we made it. And it's called The Breast Advocate. You can download it free it's at uh, breastadvocateapp.com. Um, please download it. Um, it really helps people research their options. It helps you understand things and it gives you a voice, right? That, that our, our tagline is your treatment, your voice, right? So um, it, it's, it, it's important that women realize that the days of your healthcare practitioner, whoever that may be, telling you what you need to do and having this kind of paternalistic, not even exchange, but it's just this paternalistic experience because there's not much of an exchange. Right. <laughs> honestly, that, that's, that should be just, that should be dead. Uh, so we know now data shows, studies are being done, and we know that if a patient is included in their treatment planning, they do better. They have skin in the game, right? They have dis- they they've 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 weighed up what's important to them. They make decisions based on what's important to them. So then, unfortunately, some people have complications, right? You know, mm-hmm. a surgeon who's never had a complication is someone who's either delusional or who has never operated, right? Because unfortunately, with surgery, anyone can have a complication. Mm-hmm. Um, admittedly, some surgeons have more than others, so you still got to do your research. But we all have them. Um, but you know, a patient's experience is always great when things go well. Every doctor is amazing when things go according to plan, right? It's when things don't go according to plan where the rubber meets the road. And then you don't want to be in a position where you're saying, oh crap, if I knew that could happen, I wouldn't have done it. Or, you know... (laughs) There all sorts of examples, right? But it's the truth, you know, like shared decision making, what you said, you brought up two really good points, you know, shared decision making is so important. And I don't think it's offered enough. And then the other part of it is, is getting through it and making that decision and having your support from your physicians, you know, like, as I sit back here, and you ask, like, you know, you said, like, what would you ask a person on zoom? And, you know, somebody who's gone through it, I've never been asked those questions. Like, and other women on this call, I'm sure, can relate. So it's interesting, you know, how every physician has different goals on what they want to do to get to their patient. Like, how do you get back to normal, right? Mm-hmm. I've spoken to so many survivors recently, and one today, and she's like, I just don't feel normal. I'm a year out. And I'm like, it's going to take time, and we have a new normal. And I think, like, knowing that ahead and really being open with your patients is really imperative in making a decision of, your physician choice and you saying, yes, you want to operate. Mm -hmm. And also what's normal is different for each person, right? So we don't even know what that means unless you ask. And and also some women feel overwhelmed, right? Um, At the best of times, and they feel Mm -hmm. even more overwhelmed if they're asked to make a decision Um, or to input, you know, people's thresholds for being involved in the decision making is different. But that also, ironically, is shared decision making. Me asking you, hey, all right, listen. I mean, not that I would ask it like this, but in a nutshell, you know, Mm -hmm. how do you want to be involved in your decision making? You know, um, we could have a conversation in in a consultation that basically using different words and different sentences, different Mm -hmm. conversations, that would be what I would be asking you. Right. right, and there are some women that say, "You know what, Doc? I'm so overwhelmed right now. I, I just want to know what you would do if I was your wife, and then let's do that because that's that's all I can handle right now." Right. But her making that decision is part of that shared decision-making process. You're now telling me that's what you want. 
Right. Right. So, so to be clear, shared decision making doesn't have to be this overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. It very much is determined by what you're up for and what you're ready for. Right. So, anyway, it's fascinating to me. It's really taken my practice to a different level in terms of how I think about things and how I think about being the best I can be for my patients. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not for everyone but it definitely works for me and for our practice, you know, and we all embrace different degrees. But um, for me, it's the most ethical way to practice medicine, right? Because who am I to impose on you what I think is best for you? I can tell you what my opinion is and what I'm recommending, but surely I need to be open to the idea that what is initially my first thought may not be the best thing for you. Right. I mean, come on, we've got to be more cerebral, right? Than just, right. this isn't mm -hmm. So anyway, um, yeah. And anyway, that's my life now, you know, breast reconstruction and shared decision-making, breast advocate app and PRMA, that's, that's my bubble. So uh, download it, it's free. Mm -hmm. Don't miss it. It's an amazing app and it gives you amazing answers and information. And really, like we talk about knowledge is power. It's a tool that every woman should utilize and it, share it with your friends, share it with your family. You know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for it. I feel like it even has helped so many of our women personally I've seen and I get so much feedback. So everybody should download that app on your phone as soon as we end this Instagram live. Don't miss the rest of the call. <laughs> Please do. I did see a question from someone. Yeah. Um, someone uh, went for a consultation. I, 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 the question's gone now. Uh, but uh, I, I think Here, you want me to ask you? I can see it. I think it was, you know, I, I had implants and I want a deep flap and, and, or I've had a tummy tuck, I can't, have a, I can't have a deep flap or something. Oh, there's more. There's another one above that. You want to answer that one first? Um, I can read them to you if you want. Let me see. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, PRMA is amazing. Thank you very much. It says, what happens if you're not a candidate for a deep flap, but wants their prosthetic removed? Is there options for that? Yeah. So let me answer that in two ways. Um, so first and foremost, there are lots of different tissue options. So it's just the deep flap, right? So... Right. Um, you know, and, and, and a surgeon who specializes in tissue reconstruction should be able to offer you more than just one procedure. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not just, it shouldn't be just implants or a deep flap, right? We have other options available to us. There are a bunch of thigh options. You can use the buttocks. Uh, certain procedures are more common than others. Uh, in our practice, we very much prefer using the thigh there are several thigh flap options you can use. Um, so we prefer the thigh um, as a source of tissue, either the inner, the outer, or the upper part of the posterior thigh underneath the buttock crease. So tug flap, vug flap, pap flap, LTP flap. Those are the acronyms. So we prefer the thigh as the second line option. So if someone uh, has had a tummy tuck, uh, mm -hmm. so they're not a candidate. If they've had a full tummy tuck and they're not a candidate, or they've had a ton and you know multiple multiple abdominal surgeries, and I don't mean a couple of cesarean sections. I mean major mesh repair, you know, you know, a bunch of stuff, and they're not a candidate. Mm -hmm. Or you know, if um, they truly don't have any tissue on their belly, or um, they don't want a scar on their belly because it's their favorite part of their body or something. You know, we see that sometimes. I would caution people. Um, we see many, many ladies from all over the country who have been told they are not candidates for a deep flap. And we see them and we're like, yeah, you are. <laughs> right? Uh, don't quite say it like that, but basically in a nutshell, you know, and so, and there are two aspects to why they may have been told that they're not a candidate. Number one, um, or three aspects. Number one, they're truly not a candidate because they don't have any tissue. When you touch, when you pinch the belly, it's just skin. 
fine. You may not be a candidate. You're probably not a candidate. If your BMI is 16, that's going to be rough, right? That's, that's If your BMI is 19, 20, 21, you could still be a candidate because it depends on how you carry that small amount of tissue that you have. If it's in the right position, you could still be a candidate, um, especially if it's only for one breast because you can use all the tissue just for the one breast. There are times, though, that people are told they're not candidates because the surgeon doesn't feel comfortable. And maybe they don't feel comfortable because they don't have the expertise. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't feel comfortable because they think, oh, dude, this is kind of really stretching it, I'm, you know. And so what I would say is make sure the person who's telling you that has the appropriate expertise to make that judgment call. Right, because if it's not someone who does this routinely, um, chances are they're, they're well, I don't know how big a chance, but there is a chance you could still be a candidate if you saw someone who was truly experienced in doing these procedures. Yes. That, that's, I think, where we have a little bit of like miscommunication with some of the women and they don't want to go for second opinions or they feel bad because they're committed to their surgeons. No, you listen, know, knowing that. You can love your surgeon, okay? And a second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been, you know, it's been interesting. Sometimes patients tiptoe around second opinions. Mm -hmm. um, there have been times when a patient doesn't like what I have to say and I'll just offer it. Say, hey, listen, right. I'm you're not comfortable with the way this is going and what I'm recommending. And, you know, why don't you, why don't you go visit with someone else? You know, I, I can give you a bunch of names that, are, that I respect greatly, right? Right. If a second opinion doesn't hurt and it doesn't burn any bridges, and even if you go for a second opinion, it doesn't mean you have to use that second opinion doctor, right? Correct. Often it often validates what the first doctor told you. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with a second opinion. If, if your physician, if it's come up and your physician is trying to dissuade you, opinion, don't just walk, run. Run fast. Because come on, man, we're all in, we're, we're all about doing the best for the patient here. Um, and, uh, you know, we can be comfortable with our recommendations and um, we, we should not be in the business of dissuading second opinions. We should be encouraging them to anyone who may, anytime we feel that they may, there may be some, any, any degree of discomfort, mm -hmm. second opinion is always a good thing to talk about. I agree. So patients listening to this, please don't be scared of second opinions. Um, so yeah, but to this, for this question, you know, uh, not a candidate for a deep flap. So that may be true. If it is true, you do have other options if you're removing your implants. Things that implant patients need to consider and grapple with is, you know, the, the look of a tissue reconstruction is typically very different to an augment, to a, to a, an implant reconstruction and mm -hmm. at an implant reconstruction knows that an implant reconstruction usually is nothing like a boob job either, right? And so uh, <laughs> anyone who's listening to this who hasn't had cancer, please don't say that to your friends who's getting implants after their mistake. It is not a free boob job. It is not a boob job. It is a journey that nobody should have to endure. <laughs> and we need to find a cure for cancer of the breast and for the genetic mutations to stop being passed down. It is not a free boob job. And that's anybody true. that's listening, make sure you don't say that like Dr. Yeah. C said. There's yeah. a lot of misconception and it's not an easy process. Forget like just your breast, but like mentally and physically and emotionally. And I don't think people know or realize what it entails. Yeah. And let me explain why just briefly. Perfect. Uh, because, you know, when someone wants a cosmetic augmentation just to be fuller, right? They want a bigger breast cup size. Even if you're an A cup, 
even if you feel you're flat and have no breast tissue, I guarantee you, you have more tissue than most mastectomy patients are left with after a mastectomy. The amount of tissue that someone has left behind is make or break for a successful implant reconstruction. So the more padding you have, the nicer the result. So even in a smaller breasted lady who goes for a cosmetic breast augmentation, they are almost always going to have much, much healthier and a greater amount of healthy tissue to cover their implant. The more, more tissue covering the implant to camouflage it and protect it, the better the result. With a mastectomy patient, sometimes you have skin and a little bit of fat. You know, if your breast surgeon is very good, you can, you can have high quality mastectomy flaps and get a really nice result with an implant reconstruction. But for most women, falls way, way short. I, you know, I, I have women, so when I put a presentation together, what, what, you know, what do we do as physicians, right? When we do presentations, what do we do? Uh, most of us show our best results. Some of us show our best results, then we'll show an eh, you know, normal result, and then we'll show a bad result, right? Typically, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's most of us who have been in practice a little bit longer that will give you the full gamut, right? But, you know, if someone asked me to give a talk on how good implant reconstruction can be and show my best results, I probably I can probably count on two hands the number of women who look like they've had a cosmetic breast augmentation. You know, we we work with so many different breast surgeons. A lot of the time, we cannot control the breast surgeon who's involved in the patient's care. We just have to work with what we're left with. When the patient comes to us first, we have full control and we we have we know we're going to get a high quality mastectomy right but a lot of women unfortunately are not in that position so that's why another take home message from this needs to be for women looking at mastectomy and reconstruction or even oncoplastic surgery where in this country anyway it's the breast surgeon most of the time working with a plastic surgeon some breast surgeons do oncoplastic surgery, which is what that means is if you're having a lumpectomy, the lumpectomy is done in a way that maximizes the cosmetic result of the breast, either through a breast reduction or a breast lift, right? So for, for many women in this country having an oncoplastic procedure, lumpectomy, they too will have a breast surgeon and a plastic surgeon. So in that situation, but mostly for women having a mastectomy, wanting breast reconstruction, pick your team. Don't just go to the breast surgeon who, you know, your gynecologist sent you to, whatever, and then you pick your plastic surgeon and think you're going to have an amazing outcome and that's guaranteed. Doesn't work that way. Don't do it. <laughs> breast make plastic surgeons look good. Mm-hmm also make us look bad. Pick your team. Pick people that work together all the time. The level of understanding that, that exists in, will improve your outcome. I guarantee it. Okay? Picking a team is imperative in your journey. Like, your stick with the team. Pick your doctors know each other. It's so important. And I think that, you know, in certain states, right, like, we don't have teams. Like, teams don't exist in certain states, but knowing two surgeons that work hand in hand, you are so much better off going to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, agreed. Um, so there's a follow up. Post here. That's not the issue. Not enough tissue. Okay. Well, so looks like you're not a candidate, unfortunately, in which case, please know you may be a candidate for other types of tissue reconstruction, depending on your tissue distribution. So deep flap is not the only tissue option. Um, is it possible to do fat transfer to replace implants? Yes. Uh, what you need to know there is that that's typically multiple, multiple stages to get a fuller breast. So unless you want to be, unless you're you know, really athletic and want you know, fairly small cup size, you're still looking at multiple procedures there. 
especially if you've got um, bigger implants, right? And so, you know, switching from implants to any, any sort of tissue reconstruction, you know, the look is very different. So, um, and sometimes, especially if you don't have a huge amount of tissue, sometimes women with larger implants, if they're looking to remove those, are going to have to wrap their heads around a more natural appearing look and a smaller overall cup size, right? So a smaller cup size, we still have options to make that bigger after the fact. You know, some plastic surgeons are doing implants underneath flaps. Some of them are even doing it at the same time. I don't advocate for that personally. I think I, I feel that's too risky that some surgeons pull it off routinely. Uh, that's not an approach we use. Uh, typically for us, if someone doesn't have enough tissue for a full breast or the result that we all want, um, primarily her, then uh, we can enhance that reconstruction with fat injections, uh, you know, typically at stage two. So in our practice, most women get two stages because we feel that we can always make someone look better, um, you know, good enough, you know, good enough ain't. <laughs> so, right, exactly. So it kind and of everybody has a different choice, right? Like some people come back for stage three too, right? Am I right? Say, say again? Does some people come back for more than state after stage two we for have, stage three? Yeah, I've had a select number of patients that come back for more fat grafting after stage two, which can get tricky. It's also geographically, it varies. Some institutions, you can go back as many times as you like. Um, you know, in our practice, it's a lot harder to do multiple rounds of fat injections. Uh, we get mm -hmm. it from our local insurance carriers for that. It's very tricky. Uh, so make sure wherever you are, whichever practice you're in, get, you know, get the lay of the land in terms of what's doable because not, mm -hmm. not always the same. You know, uh, I was on a panel with a surgeon from uh, uh, Penn um, and uh, we were talking about revisions and number of re revisions. And I mentioned that, you know, in our practice, you know, you can't come back and do five rounds of fat grafting and expect insurance to pay for it. And she says, what are you talking about? We can do as many revisions as we like. I'm like, well, that's great for your patients, but that's not the lay of the land where we are, right? So make sure you check out with your specific physician, your practice, make sure you understand what the deal is. You don't want to be left with a, with a financial surprise, right? Okay. Uh, do you see the question? Can you see it? What uh, would, would that be with expanders versus direct to implant? Say again? So would that be with expanders versus direct to implant? I currently have implants and wondered if fat transfer is something PRIVA does. Uh, we do fat transfer, um, but typically um, you can't just take out an expander that's been inflated or an implant, right? And then you're left with, a, and then, then you're left with just this cavity, right? You can't just inject a bunch of fat in there to replace the expander or the implant. So what you have to do is you remove it and then the, the, the tissues, the, the fat needs to be injected into living tissue to survive. And even then between 30% and 50% gets reabsorbed. So um, there are techniques you can use to improve take rates but what i'm saying is not all the fat survives so you got to take that into account um and so if you're going from an implant or or an ex, or an expander that's been inflated uh to fat grafting you have to be prepared for multiple procedures now if it's an expander you can deflate the expander and incrementally, you know, over several procedures, you know, you, you remove fluid, you inject fat. You remove fluid from the expander, you inject fat, right? So the more you remove fluid, the more you inject fat until you build up enough injected fat to replace what the expander used to be. 
that's that's kind of a, that's called reverse expansion. Uh, it's not a technique that we're doing uh, in our practice purely because it takes too bloody long, right? And so uh, there are places in the country that I think are doing that. Um, it's that's not a procedure that. Um, uh, you know, and, and to be honest, I'm not even sure from an insurance standpoint how successful we would be in getting that covered. I don't know. Never tried it, you know. Uh, but um, but it's a technique. It's published. Uh, makes sense. And if there's someone um, out there that's, you know, that's their shtick, that's what they do, and they've got it down, go for it. Go for it. And when you said you prefer prefer multiple steps, I think maybe we just want to back it up as, you know, we've spoken before, but go over maybe deep. And I think maybe there was just some confusion. If there's, you know, normally we, you say, you know, it's two phases. So maybe if we just want to go over that again, just to clarify for the woman who asked. Yeah, so there, there are usually two phases for any type of construction. So um, most... Most implant reconstructions are done in stages still. When you look around the country, most people get a tissue expander first that's used to control the implant pocket, create the pocket you want, um, expand the size of the breast perhaps, you know, and then you need a second surgery to replace the expander with the permanent implant. And then typically we do fat injections at the same time under the skin to improve the padding over the implant to camouflage it and give the best cosmetic result. So even with implants, most women get two stages these days. Um, there are some women that didn't have nipple sparing and then the nipple reconstruction may be its own separate phase. And then if you have nipple reconstruction, well then it's never tattooed at the same time. That's done later too. So now I just mentioned four phases if you're not having a nipple sparing mastectomy, right? right. Uh, implants can be done in one stage. Uh, the best results are, like I mentioned, your breast surgeon needs to give, you know, needs to provide high quality mastectomy flaps. You know, even the breast surgeon sometimes can't do that because of the location of the cancer. And that's, that's another thing to remember, right? It's cancer first, breast second, right? Mm -hmm. So even the best teams and even the best breast surgeons sometimes they can't leave you with what they want to leave you because of the cancer please remember that your, your anatomy also matters right so we didn't give you your anatomy we just have to work with it right so what your what your bff got may not be what you got right okay so, but there may be some very, very, very valid reasons there from a cancer perspective. Uh, it's not necessarily bad work, okay? Um, so, so, yeah, so stage, yeah, sorry, I'm digressing. So implant reconstruction, usually done in two stages. There's direct to implant, which can be done in one go. Um, sometimes that works out great, you know, and, and truly it's a one and done. You know, if you have good mastectomy flaps, good anatomy, you can do a nipple sparing mastectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, your breast surgeon works with your plastic surgeon. Uh, sometimes we can do it through a crease incision, you know, underneath the breast in the IMF in the in the fold. So the breast, there's, the scar is off the breast, and you end up with you know an implant reconstruction in one go. And and you know, hopefully you don't even need fat injections later to camouflage the implant. If you do it in one go, unfortunately, you still have about a 30% chance that you'll have to come back for fat injections under the skin because the mastectomy skin will be too thin and you'll have rippling that you can see through the skin. Even if you put the implant under the muscle, you can get rippling sometimes. So that's implants. It can be done in one stage. Most women still getting it in two stage. Tissue, again, can be done in one stage. Most people, uh, our practice for sure, uh, most women are getting it in, in two stages. Um, we are, you know, breast reconstruction has moved, has, has, has evolved tremendously. Um, you know, we are thankfully about bloody time. It's taken us a long time as a specialty to get there. But uh, more and more of us now uh, 
um, around the world are focusing as much on the aesthetic result as we are on filling what the mastectomy removed, right? Because for far too long, it was all about, you know, being in awe of these advanced techniques. And then you kind of forget, you look at some of these results and it's like, look at what the patient sees in the mirror. The patient couldn't care less what's under the hood. She doesn't care how long it took or how good a microsurgeon you are. Look at the position of that belly scar. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's not a tummy tuck scar. <laughs> you know what? The, you know, so thankfully it's taken many, many years to get there. But now we're at the point where wherever possible, we are maximizing the cosmetic outcome. We've been doing that in our practice for a long time, but the movement is real and we're seeing more and more people kind of get on board with that philosophy, it's, which is great because they need to. Um, so when you have that philosophy, you know, can you make someone look decent in one surgery after deep flap reconstruction? Sure. Sure. But there's a reason I see women from around the country who had a one step deep flap reconstruction and the surgeon was happy with the results, but they're still in my office. So tell me why? <laughs> because they want to look better, right? So mm -hmm. it very much is dependent on the patient, right? And so now there have been times where, um, I look at the pay and, and you know, my nurse taught me this. This is where maturity comes in. It took me a while to mature, you know. Uh, the ego wasn't a problem. I've been married for a while now, so I don't have that issue. <laughs> but but uh, um, you know, my nurse taught me this, Denise, she's absolutely amazing. I, I couldn't do what I do without Denise. She's just, just you know, a woman in person and nurse. Um, she taught me something very important. And that is, it doesn't matter what I see. What's way more import important is what the patient sees, right? Because a few years ago, you know, a patient would come in and, you know, it's pretty good, pretty good. You know, she's had the one stage. I'd be like, okay, for the first step, this is good. Okay, so let's talk about the second stage. So we're gonna mm -hmm. do, and then I would just go off on one and just list all these things that I saw that I wanted to fix. And I remember one time the lady looked at me and said, thanks for bursting my bubble. I thought I looked awesome. I was about to come in there and say, I don't want any more surgery. And you've gone and I'm like, oh, bozo, right? But, but that was a massive learning lesson years ago now. But, you know, and, and Denise, you know, there are times now where I catch myself still, you know, and I'll look at Denise, Denise will kind of give me the look. Don't go there. She's happy. She doesn't need more surgery. She doesn't want more surgery. You know, right. she's, uh, she's, it's not important to her anymore. You know, and then at that, at that point, why subject someone to risk that's unnecessary? If right. they feel well, they look awesome, and they don't <clears throat> there's no justification. So, um, and equally, there are some women that you look at them and you say, okay, this, you know, we did great. You're done. I don't think I can make you look better. But I've got to tell you, that is such a small percentage because you've got to have the right setup going in, right? right. It has to have everything going right for her and all the stars to align, right? So that includes the anatomy to begin with, the breast surgeon, the cancer diagnosis, the patient's preferences, everything. Everything has to align, you know. Um, so, and for those of you that are just joining us, that are seized on over all the options that are absolutely amazing that every woman should know, you know, you can go on PRMAPlasticSurgery.com and see all of your options. And a matter of fact, Dr. C was kind enough to share all of our options. So we have them on Bracket Strong from them. So you have all the updated, most up-to-date technology information out there with all the reasonings and all the information and details, because again, you know, we have many times where we're not offered all of these options. And I feel that these options are imperative. So if you guys missed this live or you guys are tuning in late, you can always see them on um, PRMA's website or Brock Strong's website as well. 
And then I think we have two questions. Um, so I have breast implants the cup. Fat transfer sounds very involved. So you know, I think we have a lot of questions on fat transfer tonight, which maybe we can save for another night because honestly, Dr. C said he really doesn't do it right in your practice, right? Oh, we do. No, we do fat. We do fat grafting all the time, but we do it in conjunction with other techniques. We we don't do the multi-step, multiple fat grafting, whereby fat grafting is the only technique that's used to reconstruct the whole breast. Right. So there are practices in the country that specialize in that. You know, the technique is the same, but you know. It, and especially with traveling, it's like having people travel to us for that, for multiple steps, it's just it's a lot of work. I think they'd be better served going to people, going to a surgeon who likes doing that all the time and specializes in it and has the right setup for it. So uh, we do it. I mean, I did fat grafting on both my cases today. You know, um, we do it very, very frequently. The, the, the vast majority of my... Uh, revision surgeries involve fat grafting. It's rare that it doesn't, but it's the perfect adjunct for us. It's great for, you know, adding finished touches, smoothing out the result, making things look more natural, especially after implants, adding a little bit of volume, um, you know, after a tissue reconstruction. And then you get the benefit of the contouring from the lipo. You know, you add the benefit of that to the benefit of the actual injected fat. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not the guy for people to travel to to do multiple, multiple, multiple rounds of fat grafting if that's going to be the only method of reconstruction. Um, so, yeah, but some plenty of guys out there. I'm in Florida. Definitely. In right. Florida, there's one. There's one in Florida. Uh, a couple. Like, There's one well-known one. But Google it. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Sorry, Dr. C. Like, you can Google that. And if anybody has any questions offline, you can feel free to message me and I can try to guide you. Um, I've learned about the procedure myself. And unfortunately, in the six years that I've been having Bracca Strong, I had two women do it. One of them was an extreme success, but she had a different kind of case. She had lupus, she had breast cancer, and she just was going through it and just said, let's do it at one time and did it and is ecstatic with the one breast that she got and her other breast is normal and the other lady is absolutely miserable. So I think that you know, like Dr. C said, there's people out there who specifically do this, look for those people, the same thing with flaps. Yeah, you got to research. So, yeah, so is it okay to ask where or what your practice is? Absolutely. This is all about us. Today. PRMA. <laughs> yes, PRMA, it is. PRMA Plastic Surgery, San Antonio, Texas. Um, we, uh, we have virtual consultations, so you can get to... Uh, you don't have to travel to find out if you're a candidate for a procedure. We can uh, Zoom, Skype, whatever, typically Zoom. Virtual consultation form online is filled in, goes to Tabitha, our patient liaison. She's amazing. And amazing. Then, yeah. Amazing. And then we'll Right get, to you, so get back to you immediately. Uh, she's awesome. Um, so... Um, yeah, we're, we're here for you. Anyone who wants, uh, you know, to explore their options, um, virtual consultation form on the on prma-enhance.com. Uh, PRMA Plastic Surgery, you can Google us too. We're everywhere. Um, Follow them on Instagram, YouTube. They have amazing yeah. channels and videos. The whole team. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome, Elise. Thank you so much, Dr. C, for coming on. It was a pleasure having you, as always. And Look forward to coming on, you know, before the end of the year and maybe talking more about some gold standards and maybe talking about the new thigh flaps that you talked about. I think that those are something we definitely don't educate on enough. We talk more about deep and other flaps. So I think let's plan our next talk to talk about thigh flaps and yeah, thigh you, tonight. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you want, you know, put a poll out for all your, all your followers and stuff and we Perfect. can pick the top two, three things that they want to hear about and let's do it. Right. So Perfect. 
Um, huh? Yeah, and uh, yeah, so uh, follow PRMA Plastic Surgery. We're on most social media channels. Follow me too, uh, either Dr. Chrysopolo or M. Chrysopolo, depending on the channel. So, yeah. Keep him on his toes. They're all tagged on all of our pages. So you can see on Brockish Gong and just be able to click the link and hit follow. Thank you again so much, Dr. C, for taking the time to educate us and share your stories. And we're grateful for your commitment. I appreciate it. And thank you for letting me talk about Breast Advocate too. Don't forget to download that, breastadvocateapp.com. Got in the final plug. And with that- It's free. It's free. Don't forget to download it and share it with your family and friends. It can change your life. You can get questions at all kinds of the hours of night. That's my inner secret. Don't Thank tell you. anybody. <laughs> yeah. Or, that aspect of it, the community. It's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, so I posted in Breast Advocate. I've got to answer this question. It's like, Put it away. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> yeah. All right, Dr. C, be well, okay? Great to see you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.